These days, it seems every major blockbuster is based on a comic book property, and almost all of them rake in a billion or more at the global box office. I mean, let's face it, comic book movies are easy money for studios these days, but we all know that not all of them can be a hit. It's a sad fact that a lot of comic book movies suck, and they suck hard. Some of the biggest box office bombs were based on one comic book or another, which just goes to show that there's a right way and a wrong way to make a comic book movie. So in the spirit of looking back at these cinematic misfires and exclaiming, blur, I'm Ewan, this is what culture comics, and here's why these 10 comic book movies actually failed. Number 10. Redoing the ending in a rush. Dark Phoenix. 2019's Dark Phoenix was the biggest box office bomb of the year it was released, and it ended up being a terrible adaptation of Chris Claremont's and John Byrne's greatest story written for the comics. The Dark Phoenix saga was one of the most important X-Men stories ever told, so this adaptation had to be amazing. Of course, it wasn't, and it ended up being so far from the source material, few people even bothered to watch it after the reviews came out. The film suffered from several problems, but the biggest one was the ending, which was changed shortly before it was released. Man, not even Dazzler could save this film. Dazzler. That's how you know it was a stinker. The ending of the movie originally had one that was similar to the ending of another MCU movie, so the studio opted to reshoot the whole thing so as not to be compared to the popular Marvel Studios film. If the film had only deviated from the script up until the ending, it might have worked, but changing it like that ruined the whole movie. On its own, it's not incredibly terrible, but a lot of the plot elements seemed forced and unnecessary. The death of Mystique was meant to be a pivotal turning point, but they let that out in the trailers and ruined the surprise. That alone was a major problem, as the marketing for the movie only managed to push potential viewers away. Number 9. Ignoring the source material entirely – Supergirl Back in 1984, David Adele wrote a spin-off to the popular Superman films released in the late 70s and early 1980s. The movie that was produced was set within the world of that Superman, but the film delivered a world unlike any seen in either of the Superman films or the comics featuring Supergirl. There were some aspects of the character that did make it to the film, but the overall adaptation dropped a lot of what makes Kara Zor-El so special. The film is set after the events of Superman 3, which apparently had Superman taking care of a peacekeeping mission millions of light years from Earth. While that minor detail was met with no explanation, Supergirl arrives on Earth from a pocket dimension hosting the survivors of Krypton in what is called Argo City. When the Omega Hedron, which is a powerful artifact that powers the city, goes is missing, Kara is given leave to find it. On Earth, she somewhat falls into the role she had in the books with some changes, but the biggest issue with the story was the Omega Hedron landed in the hands of Selina, a witch who used its power to do all sorts of weird magical silliness, including summoning a giant shadow demon to defeat Supergirl. Needless to say, this was not like the comics. Number 8. Hiring a director who checked out halfway through – X-Men Apocalypse when X-Men First Class was released, it seemed as if the inconceivable timeline and poorly adapted previous films were a thing of the past. Unfortunately, as the franchise drove on, it attempted to adapt one of the biggest plot lines and characters related to the X-Men franchise, Apocalypse. Olivia Munn, who played Psylocke, gave an interview to Variety where she pointed out several issues that occurred during filming. Her biggest concern was how men and women on set were treated differently during filming, and she pointed her finger straight at the man in charge, alleged abuser slash director slash how are you still getting work, Brian Singer. It seems strange that Brian Singer could check out and say he had a thyroid issue. Instead of going to a doctor in Montreal, he said he had to go to LA. And he was gone for about 10 days is my recollection. And he said, continue, keep filming. We'd be on set, I remember there's a big scene that we'd have, and we'd come back from lunch, and then one of Brian's assistants would come up and show us a cell phone with a text message on it. And he texted to the actors, Hey guys, I'm busy right now, but just go ahead and start filming without me. If the person who is responsible for actually, you know, directing a film leaves his job to his support staff for almost two weeks, you're going to end up with a film that fails to meet expectations. Number 7. Misunderstanding Your Lead Character – Judge Dredd 
Back in 1995, Sylvester Stallone hopped onto a project that quote-unquote adapted Judge Dredd from his popular British comic, 2000 AD. There are a lot of independent comic book characters who are popular, but Dredd is easily the one most people know, as he's been around since 1977 and has a huge fan base. This movie failed for more than one reason, but if it had to be drilled down to only one, it would be the almost complete abandonment of the source material in question. Stallone couldn't do the film and keep his helmet on, which is something the fans of the comics just couldn't accept. Here's something the filmmakers should have known going into this thing, and it's something any fan of the comics will tell you. Judge Dredd never, ever, ever takes off his helmet. Even if he does in the comics, his face is always obscured. Judge Dredd is one of the only comic characters fans don't even know the look of, but what they do know is, he doesn't look like Sylvester Stallone. Number 6. Turning the character into a superhero, Jonah Hex Okay, so brief sidebar, the Jimmy Palmiotti and Justin Gray Jonah Hex run is one of my faves ever. It's a stunning saga stocked with luscious art, and it's just generally a must read for anyone who loves comics and westerns. So you can imagine my horror when I finally, finally decided to brave the 2010 film earlier this year. I'd heard bad things, but with Josh Brolin and John Malkovich playing the leads, I thought to myself, how bad could it be? Pretty bad, it turns out. Jonah Hex is undoubtedly the worst comic book movie I have ever seen, and another superhero massacred by the fellas who brought you Crank. The main issue, really, apart from the terrible direction and editing, was the film's needless deviations from the source material. Why on earth are you giving Jonah Hex superpowers? No, stop it, it's lame. It's like Wild Wild West but without a classic Will Smith tune bolted on, making the whole thing a big old waste of time. Number 5. Using a terrible script, Tank Girl Tank Girl is a popular indie comic created by Jamie Hewlett and Alan Martin back in 1988. The titular character lives in a tank and takes on various missions before being labelled as an outlaw for her sexual inclinations and drug use. It's a fun book and it was well written and illustrated. A movie based on the character could have been genuinely great, but unfortunately, the one we got in 1995 wasn't just a bad adaptation, it was a bad movie overall. The dialogue relied heavily on one-liners, and they aren't particularly punny. Another problem the movie faced was the character and comics had a cult following, which meant that the already present fan base was relatively small compared to other comic book properties like Superman and Batman. To combat this, the movie needed to appeal to a wider audience, but everything done to achieve this only made the film seem cheap and cheesy. To be fair, one thing this movie did remarkably well was the soundtrack, and while that makes for a great album sale, it shouldn't be the sole focus of the film. Compared to a movie like The Crow, which also had a compelling soundtrack and a smaller comic book fanbase, Tank Girl failed to find the right mix by relying too much on the music and less on the story and dialogue. Number 4. Messing up Doctor Doom, Fantastic Four Okay, so I'm actually not that down on the first Fantastic Four film. If anything, I thought it was immaculately cast, but it definitely had those early 2000s hang-ups that plagued most comic book movies of the period. The obligatory origin story, iffy direction, and goofy CGI, but by far the most painful was the mandatory villain must be connected to the origin elements they introduced with Doctor Doom, played in the film by Julian McMahon. Rather than lean into Doom's supervillainy and ties to Latveria, the film elected to make him just another suit motivated by jealousy for Sue Storm. The man's take is the exact opposite of what anyone would want Doom to be, and it's the film's biggest problem by far. Number 3. Alienating the fanbase entirely, Catwoman when Catwoman was released in 2004, it emerged from more than a decade of development hell, and it probably should have stayed there. It was initially going to star Michelle Pfeiffer with Tim Burton on to direct, but then eventually fell through, and after people were brought on, it eventually landed on Halle Berry to star as Catwoman. On paper, Berry could have really done the role of Selina Kyle justice. Unfortunately, she was given none of the tools to make it happen. Literally everything about Catwoman was stripped out and redone, and it completely destroyed the film. Catwoman was no longer Selina Kyle, she was Patience Phillips, and she got an overhauled origin story as well. It cannot be stressed enough, this movie has nothing to do with the DC Comics character, and it bombed as a result. Number 2. Not Getting the Tone, Howard the Duck 
Back in 1986, Marvel and Lucasfilm did something weird. They made a movie adaptation of Howard the Duck. Not that I'm duck-averse or anything, in fact, when it comes to Howard, I find myself repeating the show me the duck bit from Steve Martin's character in 2004's Looney Tunes Back in Action, but again, he's not exactly alias material by any stretch of the imagination. Regardless, they pushed through and created a film that's as strange as it is awful. It's definitely one of those movies that's so bad it's good, or at least so bad you have to catch it at least once to see what passed for an acceptable movie pitch back in the mid-1980s. The film has several funny points, but it's mostly off-putting due to the implied romantic relationship between the titular duck and Leah Thompson's character, Beverly Switzler. One scene in particular has the couple in a bed with a sheet showing only their shadows, and it… Well, if you've ever wanted to see a duck muppet get it on with an actual woman, one, I'm not here to kink shame anyone, two, but no. No, please, for the love of god, no. No. And number one, making it one giant toy advert, Batman and Robin. If you were to say the words infamous and comic book movie at a party, one, it's time to admit you're not really at a party and are instead doom scrolling into the void on Twitter, and two, someone would probably ask you if you're talking about Batman and Robin. The movie, as much as I love the sheer audacity of it all, isn't exactly well put together. And look, no one needs to dunk on Batman and Robin anymore. If you want to, there are probably about a bajillion cringy dorks on message boards who have written rants to quench your thirst, but if you want to reasonably discuss why the film just doesn't work, well, it's the fact it's pretty much just one giant toy advert. If you look at Batman Forever, even though that too was clearly spurred on by a desire to appeal to a younger audience and thus boost toy sales, it still had a compelling story and some fun performances. I'm a big fan of Joel Schumacher's neon-drenched Gotham, and honestly, I do enjoy Batman Forever as a comic book movie. There's a playful moodiness that balances out its more indulgent moments, and Val Kilmer? Genuinely a great Bruce Wayne. Batman and Robin, though, it's just full-on ham. It's one thing to have a jokery two-face played by Tommy Lee Jones, but to have a mindless Bane and a pun-blasting Mr. Freeze were just too big a departure from their more iconic depictions. 